And we're back. Less overexposed. Yay. <laughs> I can see my face again. All right. Moving right along now, Star Wars The Last Jedi. Well, it's a small movie. Not many people saw it. Yeah, nice, nice indie flick. <laughs> um, so I, I think in in the first in the earlier parts of this movie, uh, I'd give this probably an eight out of ten, maybe a mm -hmm. seven point five. In the earlier parts of this film, they it, it has some of the best stuff Star Wars has ever had. Like, yeah. some of the best stuff in Star Wars is in this movie. And then it all kind of falls apart in the third act. Mm. Like, partially because it's just too overly long. Yeah. And partially because they just keep killing characters and expect it to all have the same impact. And it doesn't. So here's your straight up warning. We're gonna spoil the shit out of Star Wars. There's your time code. For those of you who haven't seen Star Wars, spoiler: Snoke is a uh, is Obi Wan Kenobi. <laughs> uh, they reveal that Snoke is short for Snow Kane. <laughs> yes, and that he's secretly Darth Maul, and also Obi Wan's son, and is secretly Obi Wan as well, because Maul, Obi Wan, and Obi Wan's son, same person. But um. So, uh, cause they, they kill Snoke, which I think is the only death that really works. Yeah. Because it's both dramatic and a character we care about. Cause they also kill off purple hair Laura Dern. But this is the first movie she's ever been in. And she really doesn't do that much in this movie. I do feel that if, if they had had a character we had seen before, the Poe's plot would have been a bit... Difficult to do, but still, I would have liked to know her more. Yeah, it does feel like she was sort of a stand-in for Princess Leia after Carrie Fisher died. <laughs> I don't know how much of this was filmed before she died, or how much... I, I don't know how much of this was in the original script and how much yeah. they had to rewrite after she died. But, I'm, just, uh, I'm just shocked they kind of left Leia alive at the end, though. Cause yeah, well, what are they that's the thing, because, like, Laura Dern's character stays on the ship and is, like, going to sacrifice herself. But it's like, I totally expected them to pull the old switcheroo, like, Leia would do something that forces Laura Dern to go on the ship, and then she stays behind and and sacrifices herself. Because that would have been much more impactful, yeah. especially now that Carrie Fisher's dead. But, no, this character we just met is going to sacrifice herself. And then Luke dies. And that's so fucking anticlimactic. And, like, I get it, and it doesn't bother me too yeah. much. It's just that compounded with a lot of the other things towards the end there. And I'm like... I do kind of yeah, get right. why they did that. Because, like, he brought up... Luke was talking about how, like, what am I supposed to do? Fight the First Order myself. But, you yeah. know, about how his legend's just bigger than he is. But... Yeah. Still. Still. I don't know. Um. Yeah, here's the thing. Because Yoda's in this movie. And from the second Yoda shows up, that's, that just sets the tone for the rest of the movie. It's not like, oh my god, this is the dumbest fucking thing. It's just like... I'm sorry, what? Was Is that where we're going with? Alright. Alright. I will say that uh, the entire... Kylo Ren presumably being the main villain of it now is I was I was okay with him in the first one. He kind of grew on me in this in Last Jedi. Yeah, I definitely liked him so, more in this movie than I didn't because I I thought he was an annoying yeah. tool in the first movie. He kind of comes across as what I guess 
the the level of kind of what Anakin kind of should have been, I guess. I I, I definitely but, liked him a little better in this movie. Yeah, and it might just be that. The first movie was the first thing I'd ever seen Adam Driver in, and now I've seen Adam Driver in so many movies, and yeah. so many movies where he is by far the best part of the movie. <laughs> so, I'm a little disappointed that we don't, that Snoke is just there, I guess, but who am I kidding? It's nice to have it not, I guess, not just have another Emperor. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> I did really appreciate that uh, the dramatic reveal of uh, of Ray's parents is that she's no one's child, and I'm so happy about that because for two years I've been like, she better not be someone's child. She sh- she better just be some random girl yeah. that no one's ever heard of before, and everyone's like. No, she's totally like she's, a, she's Kylo Ren's sister, Luke's daughter. I've heard Obi Wan's daughter, oh. Palpatine's daughter, <laughs> everyone's daughter. I made a joke that she was uh, she was Luke and Leia's incest child from before they knew they were related. Oh, Ugh. <laughs> I don't want to think about that. But for two years, everyone's been naysaying me. Whenever I'm like, nah, she should just be some random girl. They're like, no, nah, she's obviously this. And I'm like, yeah. ha! Uh-huh. I was right, you were wrong. She is no one's daughter, and that works perfectly. Because it would just be stupid if she was anyone's child. I mean, I don't think the Force has to be hereditary, so... Unless they... Oh, dogs. Um, oh. Also, let... And of course, I'm not surprised, but apparently they're having another Star Wars trilogy after this. No one here... No, one, I don't think I told... No one can confirm this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna claim I called it. So... Uh... Well, yeah. Because they've got, like, the anthology movies they're working yeah. on. They had Rogue One. And then they got Han Solo... <laughs> Which is supposed to be coming out in, like, May, but, like, I haven't seen any proof that it's actually coming out in May. I've heard brief things about casting, and that was it. Yeah. Like, like they haven't even dropped a trailer for it yet. Yeah. And they dropped, they dropped the trailer for Episode 8, like, a year in advance. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing there's a third one of the anthology ones. I don't know what uh, they're doing. I think they're making like a Obi Wan movie. It was either that or Boba Fett. Who I don't think Boba Fett needs a movie. Maybe it's just me, but and yeah, so far they haven't cast you and McGregor for the for the Obi Wan movie. I'm disappointed. Come on, guys. It's obvious. It obviously should be. Ewan McGregor. Yeah. I mean, he was the best part of the prequels, in my opinion. Not yeah. saying much, but... <laughs> uh, obviously, the memes were the best part of the prequels. Good point. I was going to go with the or either that or the Senate. <laughs> no, that is a meme. Um, Jar Jar Binks. Totally, totally the best part. No. No. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but yeah, I love the prequel <laughs> memes and all of their like ironic glorification yeah. of the prequels. Even they are just like, nah, they're not Jar Jar. Like there are almost they don't even acknowledge. There him. are almost no <laughs> memes about Jar. If they are, yeah. they're like pure shit posting. The one meme is the entire Jar Jar Binks is a Sith Lord thing, which, um, even that. Is Star Wars Episode Eight? Um, yeah, I, I said right after it came out that because there's been this trend ever since Episode One. Because uh, two was better than one, three was better than two, seven was better than three, Rogue One was better than seven, and then I said when it came out that eight was better than Rogue One. Huh. But maybe if I watched them back to back, I might I might actually pick Rogue One over Episode huh. Eight. I don't know. 
But as far as, like, just the main series, Star Wars, goes, it has been getting better since episode one. Because yeah. eight is definitely better yeah. than seven. I do like that it's not... It, it didn't do a Force Awakens thing where it's just the same thing as a... Yeah. As the first... As A New Hope. Yeah. It kind of rhymes with Empire Strikes Back. It's similar, but... Same kind of... They're on the run from the Empire thing, but... It's different enough to be its own movie, so... Yeah. Um... Yeah, it's just the third act where it falls apart. Yeah. They kind of reveal information that would... <laughs> they kind of... Make plot lines they had already going. And not even a plot line I minded that much. People are like, oh, Poe po and, uh, not Poe. Finn, Finn and Rose. Their subplot's so pointless. And it's like, mm. I was okay with it. My it's just yeah. that the ending made it pointless. Yeah. My complaint with it was, my, my one complaint with it was kind of the the casino planet was a bit uninspired i guess but it it was it was it was doable watchable it wasn't like phantom menace so. um some good comedy in this movie like it's probably the funniest star wars and i never it never felt intrusive like it does in thor ragnarok <laughs> that's i always heard people i i did hear many people complain about it being just kind of too funny I, did, I didn't see that. I, I, I don't think it's... Yeah. Like, I would never put this in, like, the comedy category. There's just some good humor to it. It has funny moments. It, when it's serious, yeah. it's serious. It never... It never stops a serious moment to be like, <laughs> goofy joke! That's Yoo-hoo. what the Thor movie did. It, uh, it, Thor kind of yeah. did that. So... Uh... We'll move on. Uh, I think that's all I have to say for it at the moment. Because I've I've got another sequel to an '80s sci-fi franchise starring oh, Harrison fun. Ford, Blade Runner twenty forty nine, mm. which I've given eight out of ten. This movie could have been a nine out of ten. This movie maybe maybe could have been a ten out of ten. But because it's the acting is great, the writing yeah. is great, the directing is great, the cinematography is great. But the pacing is so slow. Every scene in this movie could have been cut by, like, at least a minute, and it would have the same effect. Yeah, I haven't, I have not fully seen it yet, but... It's... Yeah. I mean, I enjoyed it. I really liked it. It's a really well-made movie, but nice. yeah. the pacing's... Just kills it. It is and nice. I, see, oh, sorry. I think it's this idea that like having a slower movie is more artsy, so people will take it seriously. But like some of the best movies that have been made this decade were like fast-paced action movies. Yeah. Um. I do, I, f- yeah. I do feel it is interesting to see a. A sequel, actually, I've I've seen people review it better than the original Blade Runner, which <sighs> I don't know that I don't I'd... know if it would be that, but I guess it depends on which cut of Blade Runner you're yeah. talking about, because there's like a there million. Were, there were too many cuts of it. Um, the cut, any cut that doesn't have Harrison Ford's voiceover, the narration was just terrible. It was pointless, and it was. It's just really terribly delivered. It sounds yeah. like he didn't want to do this. Um. So I, I would I would put the original Blade Runner as better than twenty forty nine just because of how slow the pace is. Yeah. Um. Man, I had something else to say about the. I mean, I here's the thing. I probably wouldn't have gone to see this because like. I like Blade Runner, but I don't love it the way a lot of people love it. Um, Not like one of those... I, I've, I've seen people consider it one of the better movies made. Yeah. Not that level of liking it, I guess. Like, uh, so like a 
Yeah. What are we, 30 years later? <laughs> it's, it's been a while. Yeah, it would be 30 years later. That's. I think it came out in 84, which would be around 35 years, actually. But, you know, it's been a while since Blade yeah. Runner came out. So, uh, I really didn't have much interest in a sequel. And they got me into it with two words. Denis Villanova, who's just a great director. He directed my favorite film last year, Arrival. Mm. Still, still a year later, it's still my favorite movie yeah. of the year. Although, I, I dropped a top 10 of 2016 on my Twitter around the weekend of the Oscars. Just, you know, to give me some time to catch up on the movies I missed. And... <laughs> Even then, because a few months later I watched Train to Busan, and Train to Busan definitely should have been on that top ten list. Eh. But, uh... Yeah, Dini Villanova, great director. He also did Sicario, which, oh, they're making a sequel to Sicario without mm -hmm. him, and I just have no interest in that movie. <laughs> like, he... Oh, Sicario 2, does it have Denis Villanova? Nope. Not interested. Um, he's a good director, um, and I really like what he did with this movie. I just think every scene could have been trimmed by a minute, and it would have had the same impact. Yeah, I do, I do feel that is kind of common with a lot of movies. It's going too slow, so... And the, now here's where we start to get into kind of a subjective versus objective part yeah. of the list. Uh, because my next two picks are both movies that I personally really enjoyed, but I would say objectively aren't as highly as I've ranked them. Because uh, next I've got Raw, hmm. which is a French film. I'd probably give a 6.5 or a 7. Just with the acknowledgement that this movie is not going to be for everyone. Yeah. This is a really weird movie. Like, it's, it's very weird and aggressive and kind of gross, I guess, if, you, <clears throat> if so, you're not into that type of thing. Oh, how um, come? Just, uh, it's a, it's a French film. I don't know, I... <laughs> I hate to go into the plot too much because I went into it blind, and I think that really helped how much I enjoyed it. Yeah. But, like, if you're not into fucked up movies, don't watch this movie because this movie is fucked up. If you like fucked up movies, here's your spoiler warning. Uh, <laughs> More spoiling. Because the, the plot of this movie is, like, this vegetarian girl goes to college... And as part of, like, a hazing ritual, she has to eat, like, a piece of lamb liver, which she doesn't want to do, but eventually they get her to do it. And then she just kind of becomes obsessed with meat. Uh, she, like, tries stealing hamburger patties from the lunch line. Um, <coughs> she, uh, she goes out and gets kebabs with one of her friends. She's, like, eating raw chicken straight from the package. That is gross. And then it escalates to, like, her sister accidentally cuts off her finger. And she eats her sister's finger. That is a weird movie. And from that point on, it's a cannibal movie. It's, it's a movie about sexy French cannibals. <laughs> and I, I got this from the rap box, and I'm like... <laughs> Oh, my roommate walks into me watching some weird movies, but this is going to be the one movie I want him to not walk in on me watching. This is the weirdest of the weird. Weirdest of the weird. Uh, some people, I think, would call a Raw 2016 movie. It didn't come out in France till 2017, and since France is its country of origin, I'm calling it a 2017 movie. Um... It is a French movie. Uh, it has a... I think it's on Netflix, so... <laughs> if you're into weird shit, there you go. Um, 
I really enjoyed it. It's not going to be everyone's thing. Uh, it's yet another movie from a female director. So that's nice. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know that I have that much to say about it, except that it's like super fucked up, but super enjoyable. I, I do almost wish... To talk about how, like, this, I've talked about how the slow pacing has killed some movies. I almost wish this movie was longer. I wish they'd taken <laughs> more time yeah. to build up to her reveal of being a cannibal. Yeah, I guess the lack of a. Uh, I guess it just coming, coming out of nowhere is a bit. It doesn't really come out of nowhere, but it kind of. It doesn't feel all that gradual. It kind of feels like, well, here's our first stop towards that. Here's our second stop. Here's our third stop. Here's our fourth stop. Oh, we made it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could have used like a little, a little more time, just to slow it down a little. Not too much. So, I mean, if you slowed this film down too much, I probably wouldn't have liked it. But you know, I, I could, I could use it just a little slower. Um, and again, this is not going to be a movie that everyone's going to like. That's basically the only thing I can say about it, that, that negative, because people are going to watch this and be like, oh, oh, ooh, ah, ooh, uh, oh, so don't want to see that. So I guess it's not good for family movie night? <laughs> no, it's great. Perfect. I'll go get the, uh... <laughs> Get the kids. Bring the six-year-olds yeah. around and watch the movie of the sexy French kid. Because that's the thing, like, at some point in the movie, they kind of start to fetishize the cannibalism. Mm. Yeah. I mean, as compared to the other sexy cannibal movie I saw this year, Neon Demons, I definitely liked Raw better. Neon Demons was 2016, though. So, not on this list, but it was fucked up. I didn't like it that much. It, it's like if M. Night Shyamalan yeah. did a gritty reboot of Showgirls. Mm, neither of those <laughs> things are... All three of those things are something we don't need. So Yeah, I, I didn't like Neon Demons that much. But I loved Raw. I yeah. mean, if you liked Neon Demons, you'll definitely like Raw. If you didn't like Neon Demons, maybe give Raw a shot. Because I didn't like it that much. Next up, we got Kong Skull Island. It's a 7.5 out of 10. Yeah. To be fair. But that's... I probably shouldn't go public with this video. Because here I am saying Kong Skull Island... Better than Coco. Mm. Better than Wonder Woman. What? Better than Spider-Man. Better than Dunkirk. Kong Skull Island. Better than Split. Kong Skull Island. Objectively speaking, it is not as good as... Uh, Blade Runner. Blade Runner was definitely the objectively better movie. But Kong Skull Island is just so much yeah. fun. It's... I kind of expected, like, a dumb summer blockbuster, like, uh, like one of the Transformers movies. Yeah. That's not what I got. You got a not-quite-as-dumb blockbuster. It's really not yeah. that dumb. Like, I mean, not like it's a fucking brilliant film, but yeah, <laughs> it's like, oh... Like, like, you don't have to turn your brain off to enjoy it. You don't have yeah. to ignore all these glaring plot holes to enjoy it. It's not... It's or not, these, yeah. like, ridiculous jokes, like... Where a dog is humping another dog, or... Bumblebee pisses on an, a guy. Um, it's like... It's a yeah. competent movie. It's just not like a movie. It's a fun movie. It's these people go to this island... And Kong is there, and there's all these other animals, and Kong wrecks their shit, and they shoot at stuff, and there's a scene where the guy takes a katana, and he cuts a pterodactyl in half, 
And there's so many explosions. Need more explosion movies that aren't transform <laughs> movies with explosions that are not Transformers. So I'm okay and the, with that. The cinematography is good, which is a huge step above Michael Bay. <laughs> his movies look fucking terrible. It's hard to watch Michael Bay movies just from a visual standpoint. I have never seen any of the Transformers movies, and I don't plan to change that. So, <laughs> meanwhile, Kong yeah. Skull Island. I I said when I watched him, like, this is what Michael Bay wishes his movies were. It's just dumb fun. It's yeah, action packed. It's exciting. It's awesome. It's epic. And it's just a good time. Nice, nice to have one of the remakes that isn't just that is actually well done though. That that is a weird yeah. thing though, because like, it's not like King Kong was based on a book. King Kong yeah. was a movie before anything else, and yet it's been remade like five times. That is unique. Now that you mention it, it's it, it's probably been remade more than any other movie. <laughs> yeah. Because there's the original, then there's the Dino DeLorean's version, there's the animated version, there's the Peter Jackson version, and now Kong Skull Island. Which, like... Yeah. <laughs> Dear Universal, this is how you start a cinematic universe. You don't announce the world Dumbass. you've started one before you've even made a movie. Because the Dark Universe is dead. It's already dead. They have announced that they're not going through with the Dark Universe. Good. I actually saw, like, the first 20 minutes of The Mummy. Oh, uh, was it about as bad as, uh, I've well, heard? Uh, my friends and I were watching it, and after about 20 minutes, we're like, this doesn't make any sense. Let's, let's do something else. Watch a movie that I'm gonna enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> not very good. Yeah. It is good to hear though that Kong Skull Island was good though. Yeah. When I first heard they were re they were doing King Kong again, I didn't have high hopes for it. Um, te technically, but, yeah. Technically, the cinematic universe started back in 2014 with the Godzilla remake, which I didn't notice until I was editing that in those like Halloween, Friday the Thirteenth, Elm Street movies. James makes a lot of comparisons to the 2014 Godzilla. <laughs> I, he references it three, four times in those videos. That doesn't have anything to do with Kong Skull Island. Kong Skull Island and Godzilla are in the same universe. Uh, Kong Skull Island, throughout the entire movie, makes no real references yeah. to being in this universe. I think that... There's, like, a company from that movie that's the same company from Godzilla. It's not till the very end they have an after credit scene where they're like, Guys, Kong was not alone. And then they have, like, a slideshow presentation with Godzilla, Mothra, Rodan, and King Ghidorah. I believe. I might be wrong. But those are the four I'm pretty sure it was. It was, it was yeah. four different monsters from, like, the old Godzilla universe. See, that's how you do kind of your cinematic universe. You don't... You make the movies stand on their own. Yeah. I'm looking at you, DC. <laughs> post credit scenes are great for, hey, here's what else is in this universe. Yeah. I, I look forward to the future of this franchise. If they're all as just balls to the walls, awesome as King as Kong Skull Island was, yeah, yeah, this could be a good franchise. We can all it's we could always use some good, just kind of uh, movies about explosions and uh, some, smashing stuff. Some some good Keiju. Yeah. I like Keiju. As long as we don't have a more Godzilla ninety nine. Oh, uh, it's 98. 90, one of those. That That's can't be a bothered lot of fish. to remember it. Well, we just lost Godzilla in the middle of New York. <laughs> Blends into the crowd, you know? Technically, that Godzilla is in the same universe as the original Godzilla. Wasn't there... Because yeah. he, he showed up in, like, all monstrous attack or something. I forget. Didn't he get his... But he, uh, 
<laughs> yeah. He's, he's just called Zilla, not <laughs> Godzilla. And the original Godzilla kills him in like three seconds. Good. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Moving on. Lady Bird. Uh, from Greta Gerwig. Um, honestly, I probably could have put Kong Skull Island or Raw above this, but I decided to have some dignity and be like, okay, fine, we'll put we'll put Lady Bird above those. Yeah. It's an 8 out of 10. Good movie. Um, I, I liked it better than the one other Greta Gerwig movie I've seen, which was uh, Francis Ha. Although Lady Bird very easily could have just been a prequel to Francis Ha. Huh. <laughs> like, even timeline-wise, yeah. it lines up. Because this takes place in, like, 2002, 2003. <laughs> so. Yeah. And it's about her graduating high school and going off to college. While Francis Ha is, like, after she's graduated college. Francis Ha, another one of those movies where Adam Driver is by far the best thing. <laughs> Um, Adam Driver, I guess, is underrated as an actor, though. I don't know about underrated, because, like, people have started to take notice. Yeah. They're like, yo, Adam Driver? Good actor. It is, it is nice to see him actually uh, get more roles, though. Get more roles. Or get more noticed. Yeah. Um, I mean, Lady Bird, uh, it's, a, it's a fun movie. It's uh, a nice kind of look at high school. Very, yeah. very realistic portrayal of high school. I don't know that it has as deep or complex things to say about high school as compared to something like The Breakfast Club. Yeah. Or, like, even, like, Election. Uh, there, there are definitely better high school movies than this. But it's a, it is a very realistic Much high school more, movie. Yeah. Not as... You know, it's it's not as sterilized as a lot of high school movies yeah. tend to be. Um, it's a lot of fun. There's some buzz right now about giving Greta Gerwig uh, like a best director nomination. Mm -hmm. I feel like if the Oscars, not that she's she did a bad job directing or that this is a bad movie. Yeah, it just feels like if they did that. It would only just to be like, oh, we're not sexist, see? We, we gave a woman a Best Director nomination. <laughs> no chance in hell she's actually winning. But, uh, look, we gave her the nomination. We did that much. <laughs> we did that much. <laughs> I was thinking, yes, because, like, some people were kind of... Yeah. None too happy that there were no women nominated for Best Director at the Golden Globes. And I was thinking, like, oh, who would I say is best director this year? Uh, and it's it's Jordan Peele. And I'm like, surely a black man has won best director. Hasn't happened. Mm. Not a single black Strange. person has won best director. I know. That Strange. is weird. <laughs> There's no chance in hell of him winning either. Because Get Out is a genre movie. And the Oscars hate genre movies. <laughs> Moving right along. I didn't have that much to say about Lady Bird. It's a good movie. That's fair. Go see it. Moving right along. Captain Underpants. <laughs> People are probably going to be mad at me for having this this high on this list. But it's... Like, I feel like a lot of people didn't go to see this movie because they're like, Captain Underpants. That just that's ridiculous. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm over here. I grew up reading Captain Underpants. I loved the books as a kid. And I think they hold up, honestly. <laughs> like, because you kind of go into them as a kid because yeah. they have a bunch of poop jokes. But there's, like, some genuinely good satire in them. Yeah. At least for, like, children's books about poop jokes. There's some good satire. And there's some good satire in the movie as well. It's very fun. It's very fast-paced. It's very well-made. Um, if I had seen this as a kid, I probably would have loved it. It probably yeah. would have been, like, my favorite movie ever. <laughs> Although, I was a little more anal retentive back then. I might have been like, that's not how it happens in the books. <laughs> you gotta do it like in the books. It's gotta be 100% accurate. 
And there, there are a lot of really fun callbacks to the book in the in the movie. But yeah, it's really fun, fast-paced yeah. children's movie. Yeah. Um, there are some negatives to it. Like, I was always kind of not okay with casting Kevin Hart as uh, George. And even in watching the movie, I'm like... Both of them. Both George and Harold. I forget yeah. who played Harold. Uh, I can look that up real quick. But, like, yeah. they they have adult voices. They don't sound like kids. It sounds like two adults doing these voices. That's... I'm like, they're supposed to be the third graders. That's something I do always hate about a, a lot a lot of movies with kids in it when they're animated. <laughs> they have an adult voicing it over, which... Yeah, and they, they don't sound like kids. Even a... Even a Gravity Falls had that issue. As much as I love that show, yeah. Dipper sounded a little, a little almost bit. too old at times. Yeah. It's... I know why they do it, because it's hard to get a kid to actually voice act things and be good, but... Yeah. It's still gonna bug me every time it comes up. But I mean, like... Yeah. You get someone like Nancy Cartwright, who does Bart Simpson. That's and, like, fair. half the Simpsons. It's like, <laughs> she can do a little kid voice pretty well, and it sounds like a kid. Yeah. Um, and my other problem is like kind of the way it wraps up is like because <laughs> they have to keep defeating it's like oh we defeated the villain oops now we have to do this other thing oh now we defeated the villain oops we gotta do this other thing oh now no no and it's like there's three or four endings yeah. to this movie I'm like just just defeat him and end the movie. Be more, uh, more straightforward, I guess. Yeah. With an ending. But, um, but I mean, not a great kids film. Fast paced. Yeah. Very funny. Uh, very, like the animation's good. A good representation of the books. I, I mean, I think there's even some good stuff in there that adults would enjoy. No, nah, not like, it's not like the Lego movie or yeah. Up or anything, but it's a lot of fun. It, it And it is nice to have some actually, uh, with all the Illumination Blue Sky movies come out, nice seeing actual a kid's movie that isn't more uh, Minions, <laughs> so. I will give credit, because um, yeah. I did my most top, most pointless movies of the year, and last year the list was like, predominantly kids' movies. And there yeah. were fewer kids' movies this year. Plenty, but... Still plenty. Still taking up the top three slots. Ugh. And still... Still giving... Well, I say still. And giving my video a false copyright strike. <laughs> Suck it, Lasso. Suck it, Open Roads. I assume they... I, I don't know who they work for. So I looked Lasso up. Yeah. They're just like a, a multimedia consultant. Which one did uh, Lasso A social make? media consultant. So so they don't actually make movies. They huh. just work for the people who made the nut what? job. <laughs> and they're the ones giving me the strike. Ouch. Not the actual company. Well, the actual company couldn't even be bothered to do it themselves. That's how little they care about it. Yeah. Get fucked, Lasso. Also, get fucked, uh, Indonesian company that's got the strike on Lady Terminator right now. I have to deal with that shit. I don't know what's about to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on. It. 8 out of 10. This was not even on my radar. Because I did not like the first It all that yeah. much. And I'm like, oh boy, this reboot looks like a fucking jump scare fest. And then it comes out and everyone's like, yo, this is so good. And I'm like, uh, alright, I'll go see it. And Yeah, it was really Actually, good. Actually, but yeah. <laughs> um, like, uh, what really, so, like, the kids are great. Because, like, child actors are not usually very good. Yeah. And also the way kids are written in movies, they get annoying really fast. But these kids are, like, funny, and the performances are good. 
like both well written and well acted kids. That's an absolute That's, rarity. I can't think of many movies who've done that. And so, uh, beyond that, Bill Skarsgård as Pennywise, fucking perfect. Like that opening scene where he's talking to Georgie, and it's like, my God, he's so like, like. There's something inviting about his performance, but also sort of threatening. It's like, you could see how a kid would fall for this. How a kid would be like, oh yeah, I should get into the sewer with yeah. this guy. Whereas, say... But... Yeah. Like, it's also, like, kind of scary. Like, oh crap, what's this guy up to? Yeah, that's I mean, like, in the first one... Like... I love Tim Curry. Yeah. He's more just weird. He's Tim Curry. Yeah. <laughs> and he's so he's the only thing I like about the old it because he's just so off the wall. A- anything Tim Curry does is just weird and it's great. What? What? <laughs> what? What? I I also like that they kind of cuz the book is about them as like kids and adults and yeah. they cut the adult plot out. See, that's... Although they yeah. massively sequel-baited it. Because, like, at the very end, it comes up with the title. It's like, It, Chapter One. I'm like, oh, are you gonna do a sequel? As far as... I will say, as far as, like, uh, It probably did need to be two movies. If they were, you know, if assuming yeah. they're gonna do the kids and adult thing, but... Yeah, I felt like it didn't really need the adults. Yeah, story. Although, that's fair. Because I'll give him. This was actually pretty clever. The remake came out twenty-seven years after the original, and like in the story, like Pennywise shows up every twenty-seven years. So that was pretty clever. So if they wait twenty-seven years for yeah. <laughs> The sequel. Wait for the kids in the first one to be adults and just recast them, you know? Yeah, there you go. So if It Chapter 2 comes out and... Oh, what would be 27 years from now? 2044? Close enough. So summer 2044. Be on the lookout. Yeah, 44. Yep. Summer 2044. Be Boom. on the lookout. Um, yeah, it's just a really good horror movie. And didn't have nearly as many jump scares as the trailer made it out to be. There were some jump scares. But they all kind of worked. I feel, there, I feel there's always going to be some... I guess it's an easy way to get rid of tension. At, to reset the tension at some point, but... Yeah. But I mean, yeah, that's kind of the thing about tension. Like, if your tension is building up, it has to be building to something. So yeah. it's not like a dumb jump scare where like someone closes the fridge and someone else is standing there and it's like dumb, and it's like not even a villain. Yeah. It's just their um, it's just their kid, like their kid, get a glass of water briefly. Yeah. No, all, all the jump scares are. Appropriate. Yeah. Appropriate enough. <sighs> Moving right along. A movie that didn't get a lot of attention. The Belko Experiment. Should give an 8. I saw the trailers for that one. It was good. Was that um, the one with the uh, the office? Yeah, it's this, o- it? this office building gets shut down and they're like, Alright, uh, everyone, uh, you've got to... Kill your co-worker. Kill three of your co-workers, or we're gonna kill six of you. Um, and so it's kind of... It's like Saw meets Battle Royale. Yeah. So, it's a lot of fun. Um, really creepy. Uh, it was written by James Gunn, who I like as a writer and director. Um... He's been doing a lot lately, which is... I'm perfectly fine with. Yeah, funny dude. Um, It's just... 
a really fun movie. Yeah. Of people killing the shit out of each other. So it's more of an action than like a horror, I guess, right? Uh, it's a little of both. Okay. Sound, sound like I said, yeah. Saw meets Battle Royale. It is... I guess, yeah, it is true. There are many more good horror movies this year. <laughs> some reason. Um, yeah. See yeah. Belko Experiment. Um, the Disaster Artist. I don't know why The Disaster Artist is this high. 8 out of 10. Uh, admittedly, that probably should have been down below even Lady Bird. I feel you can read the book for but, it, and it's... It, well, that's the thing, because the book was... <sighs> There's this deeper exploration of Tommy Wiseau as a character and his relationship with Greg Sestero that it's so much more emotionally complex than a James Franco comedy was ever going to capture. Yeah. Like, I, I said of this movie in my written review... It's basically just playing the greatest hits from the book. It's like, hey, you guys, this funny thing happened on the set of The Room. Let's all laugh about how silly the making of The Room is and how it's a bad movie. Um, I don't mean they kind of get into the emotions of it. But at the end of the day, it's still a James Franco comedy. Yeah. You know what you're getting into with this. The book is a lot deeper. The book is a lot more emotional. Uh, I would highly recommend the book. One of the best books I've ever read, honestly. Um, well, the movie cuts out a lot that happens in the book. So I, I would, I would recommend the book over the movie. Uh, but the movie's fun. It's a it's fun. It's a James Franco comedy about the making of the room. And James Franco, man, like... He was he's, pretty spot on. He's so good. As Tommy was so... I forgot I wasn't watching Tommy was so at a few points. Um, and D Dave Franco plays Greg Sestero. But, like, because I've seen The Room eight times... Yeah. And I've read the book three times, and I've seen Dave Franco in some other movies. There was never a moment where I'm like, oh yeah, this is Greg Sestero and not Dave Franco playing Greg Sestero. Like, I didn't... He didn't get as lost to the role as yeah, uh, James Franco did. It was... But I mean, he, he was good. He yeah. was good in the role. Um, I will say it is nice. It is nice to see a little more <laughs> people actually... I, it is nice to actually be able to talk about the room and people know what I'm know what I'm referring to now, a little more so than before. I mean, Tommy was so <laughs> was on stage at the Golden Globes last night. Oh, that and he missed. tried to pull a Kanye West on James Frick. <laughs> like, yo, James, How I'm gonna let you finish. <laughs> but Fantastic Four was one of the best movies of all time. How'd that go? <laughs> Tommy was so thinks that fan Fantastic movie is great. Like, apparently someone asked him what his favorite movie of 2017 um, was, and he said Fantastic Four, and they're like, that came out two years ago. He's like, it is still a great movie. How am I not surprised he <laughs> likes that movie so much? Um, um, that sounds about right. He also called The Disaster Artist 99.9% .9 approved because James Franco can't throw a football. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Tommy was so you know best uh, should have been a quarterback, probably. Uh, yeah, not, not a quarterback. Mm. You know, one of the guys that like, but like he of, he should have been like throwing and catching. He should have been one of the football players for the football team. <laughs> yes, he should have played sport. He is sport. good at L at the sport. He would score many more points than opposing team. <laughs> um, as far as like the res the supporting cast, yeah, it's like because they have oh the dude that played Peta in Hunger Games, Josh Hutchinson, playing Diddy, and he looks 
just like Denny. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. And, like, Zach Efron is Chris R., and he's pretty good. Weird. Yeah. But then the girl they have playing Lisa doesn't look even a little bit like Lisa. Like, not at all Considering like how Lisa. well cast the rest of the movie was, a little jarring. Yeah, like... And because cause in the book, uh, he tells the story of how even though uh, the character of Mark was written for Greg Sestero, uh, he didn't want to play Mark, so Tommy had cast someone else as Mark, and that Mark was dating the person playing Lisa, and then Tommy finally convinced Greg to play Mark, and he's like, I'll just fire these people. And so he fired both the original Mark and the original Lisa. So at first I thought she was supposed to be the original Lisa, Nope. And not Juliet Daniela. That sounds right, but I might be wrong. Um, um, the girl who actually played Lisa in the movie. I thought she was the person who didn't play Lisa. Yeah. And no, no, she, she was looked. Lisa. And she doesn't look a thing like her. Um, Seth Rogen's in the movie, and he's mostly just riffing the room. Which it's like, come on, Seth, it's the room. We all know why the room is terrible. I think most of us have seen it before. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a James Franco comedy about the making of the room. You know what you're getting into. Moving right along. Uh, Professor Marsden and the Wonder Women. This was a really good movie that kind of flew under the radar when it came out. I... Um, I heard of, saw a few trailers, but eight, eight and there wasn't any. Ten. Yeah, uh, it, it's about the guy who created Wonder Woman, and how he had two wives, and how they had kinky sex all the time, and he invented the truth that, or the lie detector, which he didn't actually do. That was kind of a gross inaccuracy with this movie. They're like, oh yeah, he made the lie detector. He yeah. didn't make the lie detector. He made, like, a heart rate thing that helped make the lie detector work. Yeah. Um, I don't know. This movie's a lot of fun. It's really funny. It's fairly informative uh, outside of the gross inaccuracies with it. Um, a really, just really interesting story. A really well-made movie. Um, I'm really sad this flew under the radar. Yeah, it's, it's it's really interesting. I I'd seen a, I saw like one trailer for it, and then it just kind of vanished. It, uh -huh. it really did not get noticed somehow. So, mm -hmm. which is a little strange. Yeah, we're mostly in the top ten now. Technically, it's 11, but one of my top 10 is, uh, is, a uh, Netflix. Oh. A Netflix movie. So, uh, number 11, Baby Driver. Um, great, great action movie, really well filmed. Uh, it's Edgar Wright's worst movie. Hmm. Like, I'm just gonna come out and say that. This is... If this is his worst movie, <laughs> then that says good things about him. Yeah. I I feel like every one of Edgar Wright's movies has like been progressively less good than the last one. Like if if you asked me to rank all of Edgar Wright's movies, it'd be Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, Scott Pilgrim, World's End, Baby Driver, which is chronological order. But I mean, still yeah. that he's still making movies that are in my top ten or so, and those are his worst. So. Um, my, my biggest problem, cause like, movies like Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz are so obviously yeah. Edgar Wright. Like, you look at them and you're like, ah, that's an Edgar Wright movie. You look at this movie and it's like, I feel like anyone with a decent eye for action, like, yeah, a James Gunn, or a Matthew Vaughn, yeah. or uh, the guy who directed uh, 
John Wick. I feel like any of them probably could have directed Baby Driver. Well, not to discredit them, they're all great directors, but they're not Edgar Wright. Yeah. It As, is, it, yeah. Edgar Wright is on another level. There, there were only a few moments in this film where I'm like, ah, oh, this, this really feels like an Edgar Wright movie. I'm wearing my Shaun of the Dead t-shirt right now. Um, Shaun of the Dead is my favorite Edgar Wright movie. I think a lot of people would say it's Hot Fuzz, but I... I don't know, maybe it's just because I like zombie movies. That, that would do it. Although, I like action movies a lot, too. Action is, like, my second favorite genre. Action zombie movies. I don't know, I think... <laughs> I think it's just that, uh... I, I like horror comedy a little better than action comedy. Because horror comedy, there's, like, a dichotomy between, like, it's genuinely funny and genuinely scary... Yeah, horror movies in general. There are so many that. Are, there are so many. There's uh, so many horror movies that just kind of have that. There's just a fine, a pretty uh, close line between them that blurs a lot. Mm -hmm. And you know, in horror and comedy. That yeah, I mean, I mean, I feel like horror and comedy are two distinct ideas, whereas like. A lot of the things that make an action movie good also make a comedy movie yeah. good. True. True. Um, Baby Driver, really good movie. A lot of great performances. Um, like, the main guy, he... Oh. He has, like, a really weird name. I forget. Uh, but the, he's, like... He manages to hold his own against some, like... Like, for someone I've never seen in a movie before, he holds his own against, like, John Hamm and Jamie Foxx and Kevin Spacey. That's that's <laughs> gonna make going back and watching it slightly harder. <sighs> Kevin Spacey's such a good actor, though. He's, He's a really good actor. I was, I was watching my Most Pointless Movies yeah. of 2016 video... To, like, prepare for uh, the 2017 one. <laughs> and one of the ones I listed was uh, nine minutes. And I'm like, but Kevin Spacey's such a talented actor. And I'm just like, <laughs> dude, lay off Ooh, the Kevin the Spacey movie. praise. <laughs> like, it's not not that he's not a good actor. Yeah, just but, a few uh, other Just, he's kind of, a, kind of a creepy dude who did some not okay things. But still, we can't blame this movie for that. Yeah. This this movie's good, even with him in it. Uh, he's very good in the movie. And the fact that the, the main character could hold his own against these, like, A-lister Oscar nominees is just, I think, really speaks to how well he did in this movie. Um, Underrated actor or just a good script or both, like... I'm yeah. not sure which, but... Um, the, the editing in this movie is great. Because it's... Like, all these action scenes are set to these songs. And... Like... Cause I, th I think Edgar Wright said he's had this script for a while now. Yeah. And I, I figure he was probably sitting on it until he could get the rights to all these songs. Because, <laughs> like... The movie would yeah. not work the same without the songs in it. I like movies with, uh, I do like them when movies have, like, songs that are actually put it put in the movie in a good way, like Baby Driver or Guardians of the Galaxies. Mm -hmm. But they seem like it's such a big issue to get rights to, so we just don't see that many of them, but... Yeah. Or when they do, it, mean, yeah. Then you compare it to something like Suicide Squad... Where there's a new pop cue every minute. Every yeah. single character gets their own pop cue. And it's the most basic song you can think of. It's like, ah, here's the Joker. He's the bad guy. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. Yeah, so it might be a good thing we don't get that many of them, but... Not, not that any of them were bad songs. They yeah. were actually all pretty good songs in Suicide Squad. It's just forced. They just had no idea how to do a pop yeah. cue. It, it uh, was forced. Baby Driver. Problem. 
Baby Driver, first off, has some deep cuts, some good music, and it just works into the plot so well. And it's all diegetic music. Diegenic music? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's all music that's actually in the movie that he's actually listening to. Yeah, it's... It has a bit more of a reason to be there, I guess. Mm -hmm. And just the action movie, or the action scenes just work so well with the music. Like, that tequila scene. Like, hell, man. I'm never going to be able to hear tequila and not think of that scene. Which is unfortunate, because when I hear tequila, I already think of the scene from Pee-wee's Big Adventure, <laughs> where he's dancing around with a bunch of motorcycles. Or with a bunch of... People just like making you think of things with that song. <laughs> it's a good song. Yeah. Tequila! <laughs> um, yeah. Baby Driver's just a good movie. You should watch all of Edgar Wright's movies. Go watch all of Edgar Wright's movies. I recommend all of them. Watch it right now. Pause this video and watch it right now. <laughs> uh, here we go. Jim and Andy, The Great Beyond, featuring a very special contractually obligated mention of Tony Clifton. Which is a Netflix movie. Uh, it's a documentary about... Jim Carrey yeah. and the making of Man on the Moon, the Andy Kaufman biopic, which is one of my favorite movies. I love Man on the Moon. I would highly recommend kind Man on the Moon. Kind of a biopic Moon. about making a biopic, I guess? <laughs> no, it's like an actual documentary. Oh, okay. Because oh, uh, nice. they, they were filming a bunch of behind-the-scenes footage yeah. because Jim Carrey got, like, super method with this movie. <laughs> He was acting like Andy Kaufman, even off stage, even when they weren't filming. Yeah. So behind the scenes, he's acting like Andy Kaufman, and occasionally his Andy Kaufman decided to act like Tony Clifton. <laughs> <laughs> so they got all this footage, this behind the scenes footage for like the whatever news package they were supposed to do for the film. And because, like, the, they had done, because Jim, Jim Carrey was talking about, he had done packages on other movies for, like, The Mask and whatever. Yeah. And he's, like, he, he just really didn't like it because he felt like they were kind of disingenuous. So he's, like, let me make my own. I've got, I've got this guy here who was Andy's co-writer. Uh, Paul Giamatti's character in the movie was actually on set most of the time they were filming. So he had him working on it. He had, uh, I think, Andy Kaufman's wife working on it as well. Um, and they're, he's like, they're here. Let them make this package. And they got all this behind-the-scenes footage of Jim Carrey acting like an asshole. <laughs> acting like Andy Kaufman. Acting like Tony Clifton. And then... <laughs> uh, Universal, I think, I don't know, whoever made Man on the Moon came to him and was like, please don't release this footage. We don't want people to think you're an asshole before the movie <laughs> comes out. So he's just had this footage since 1999. And finally, he's he made this movie and yeah. put it all out there. And uh, they, they have, it's... It's just an interview with Jim Carrey. That's the only interview they got was with modern day Jim Carrey. They didn't go back and talk to anyone who worked with him on the film, which I might have liked to have mm. seen. But uh, they, they they got all this footage from 1999 <laughs> of Jim it's... Carrey being Andy Kaufman, and man, I, I love Andy Kaufman, and I love Man on the Moon. It's it's just a great movie. If you if you like, I would recommend Man on the Moon, and then after you've seen Man yeah. on the Moon, you can watch this. It's kind of odd that this is a Netflix exclusive documentary because Netflix doesn't have Man on the Moon. <laughs> you think that you that'd think. be like 
oh, we have this documentary about Man on the Moon. Maybe we should also get the yeah. rights to Man on the Moon. Maybe. Or not. <laughs> or not. It is... Whatever, it, I've got the DVD. I can watch it whenever I want. It is not... I do, I do kind of, again, like, I do like to see Netflix actually uh, doing a lot of stuff of their own, too, because... With uh, the way things were kind of going, it was becoming Disney and Fox being pe- Disney, Fox, and Sony kind of being the ones to make movies. So I'm glad and to see Warner. Diver- and Warner. I'm glad to see kind of diversify out a little bit. Yeah, I don't watch a lot but, of Netflix exclusive stuff. Unfortunately, I've heard good things about a lot of it. Yeah, like I watch BoJack Horseman. I watched the new season of MST3K, and I watched this just because I love Man on the Moon. <laughs> I'm like, I'm really interested to see this. Um, like I watched it yeah. like the day it dropped. <laughs> um, but I, do, I don't. I don't watch a lot of Netflix exclusive content. I do feel the way they do is they have. They just have so much exclu- They do have so much exclusive content, like because it's oftentimes relatively easy to distribute. You know, they just put it out on Netflix, so it's well less the, costly. Their stuff time. has started falling through the cracks because like yeah. Up until recently, everyone's like, oh, everything they put out is so good. And then yeah. now they're getting, like, slammed for some of the stuff they've made this year. <laughs> Next up, Mother, the Darren Aronofsky film. Not to be confused with Bong Joon-ho's movie, Mother. Which, Bong Joon-ho gets screwed over because he made Mother, and then now we have an American Mother. He also made The Host, and then we made an American The Host. Although in his defense, uh, in this mother's defense, uh, the host was a piece of trash. Yeah. Whereas Bong Joon Ho's the host was great. It's probably my favorite of his movies. Meanwhile, his mother I thought was just okay. Whereas Darren Aronofsky's mother I actually really really liked. Uh, Eight point five out of ten. Hmm. Also, not to be confused with the Pink Floyd song, Mother, which is probably my favorite song, honestly. Mother by Pink Floyd. Yeah. Uh, but Mother, from Darren Aronofsky. Um, and a lot of people didn't like this, because it's, like, deeply allegorical. They're like, it didn't make any sense. And here's my thing about allegorical movies... To me, your movie can have, like, the deepest meaning ever. It doesn't matter how deep it is. It has to be a good movie, even if I don't get it. Yeah. Even if I cannot figure out what the meaning of this movie is, I should be able to enjoy the film. And to me, I really enjoyed Mother, regardless of whether (laughs) I understood it or not. I had a specific read on it that was kind of different than a lot of people's read on it. Oh, yeah. And I, I can kind of see their points of view. And I feel like maybe it's one of those films that you could kind of be like, oh, yeah, there's more than one way to read this. You're not... It's not specifically about this and specifically about that. But I feel like I almost wish the movie was meaningless. I wish we were supposed to take the pure insanity of this movie it, at face value. It is a really strange it's, movie it's up for her. Like, crazy. Like, I would not recommend just going into this dry. Um, I guess look it up beforehand a little bit. Here's a sentence I never thought I'd say. Maybe ease yourself in with other Aronofsky films like <laughs> Pie and Requiem for a Dream. <laughs> Those are easing in movies. That is a weird movie, then. <sighs> Maybe start with Black Swan. Because that's that's a lot more easily digestible than Pi yeah. and Requiem for a Dream. Although I don't think it's as good as Requiem for a Dream. Mm. Uh, but ease yourself into Aronofsky's films. Don't go straight into Mother. <laughs> Mother is pure insanity. It's very allegorical, but I think it's a very good movie, regardless. I because th- it's creepy. It's 
bizarre. Stands it's on fun. Yeah. It's unlike anything else I saw this year. Stands on the merit of its own weirdness. Yeah. Yeah. Also, uh, Jennifer Lawrence was in it, and she's wearing a very, very see-through shirt. So there's that. That's a positive. Movie. <laughs> <laughs> That, I don't know what else to say about Mother, because it's kind of hard to talk about. I suppose I could tell you what my take on it was. So I kind of read it as like an allegory for uh, being in a relationship with like a famous person, like being married to a famous person, and why celebrity marriages tend to not last very long. Because it's like this lonely writer and his wife... And, like, one guy shows up at their house, and he's like, Oh, I'm a huge fan. I just... I'm dying. I just wanted to meet you before I died. And... So, you know, you can get a lot of... So this is about, like, oh, you get a lot of attention out of your significant other when they don't have that many fans. But then he writes a book that's, like, huge, and their house is just flooded with people... And they're destroying everything, and everything's getting beat up, and and the way it ends, kind of uh, spoilers. <laughs> Jennifer Lawrence's character dies, and uh, her husband, it's the dude from No Country for Old Men comes in and he takes her heart out and he sets it on a shelf and it's just like at the beginning of the movie because he'd had this thing on his shelf and he's like this has been like my inspiration ever since the day I found this I've been such a better writer so it's like how an artist will take something that for you was a terrible experience and a terrible experience for them and use it as their yeah inspiration that was my read on it um and, I mean, there are deeper complexities to that that I can use to back that up, but that was my general take on it. Um, other people have thought other things. To each his own. Moving on. <laughs> a movie not that's, much else you can get. <laughs> a movie that's not allegorical at all, and that I think anyone can get into. John Wick Chapter 2. Hell yeah! <laughs> John Wick kills a bunch of people! Sounds like a good movie already. <laughs> it is. Ah, uh, I want to say it's better than John Wick 1. I don't know. At the very least, the plot is a lot less standard than John Wick yeah. 1. I, I do feel like John Wick, and to a degree John Wick 2... Benefit from what I like to call the idiocracy effect. Because in the movie Idiocracy, Luke Wilson, who is this person of totally average intelligence, uh, gets cryo frozen until the distant future, where everyone's IQ has dropped off significantly. So only because everyone else is so stupid, his mediocrity is seen as brilliance. And I think John Wick benefits from that just a little bit. Not that it's mediocre. I actually really like John Wick. Yeah. But there's a lot of stuff people give John Wick credit for. That's all oh, like the the cinematography is fluid and you you actually see people die and there's not a bunch of bullshit shaky cam. It's like you shouldn't be praising this movie for that. Yeah. Every other movie should just be doing that already. Call, uh, call the shake movies with shaky cams not good for having shaky cams, you know? Yeah. But I mean, still, the action is, like, great in both movies. Yeah. Uh, the plot's less standard in this one. That's always Although... good. Although... Yeah, I don't know. Mm. I, I, think, I think I do like John Wick 2 better than the first one. Ooh. Now that I'm just thinking about it. I don't know, it, it just seems like a better movie than the first one. But I mean, you know why we're there. We're there to see Keanu put bodies in the ground. And this... Here's the thing, I think Keanu Reeves is a good actor. He gets a lot of shit because 
he's done so many bad performances. He's he's one of these actors that thinks being serious means not showing emotion. Yeah. It's like, whoa, you guys, I'm so serious. I know Kung Ser- Fu. <laughs> And it's Serious like, and emotion can go together. Yeah. But in... <laughs> he's... I think John Wick and John Wick 2 just exemplify how great he can be in the right in the right yeah. role. And when he's actually trying. Um, yeah, that's kind of all I have to say about it. Oh, uh, I will say... Because uh, Lawrence Fishburne is in this movie. If John Wick 3 ends with him waking up and it turns out he's Neo and all the John Wick <laughs> movies were just programs in the Matrix. I, I want that now. <laughs> uh, I'd be okay with that. I'd be okay with that. <laughs> Bizarre plot twist, but yeah. <laughs> better than the shit they pulled and split true I was leaving the theater and people were like I'm so confused who's Mr. Glass and I'm like <sighs> you would know if you'd seen Unbreakable uh let's just hit these two together Lego Batman and Lego Ninjago both 8.5 out of 10s uh Yet again, it's what the, any of the movies Lego makes. It, it's weird because they have no right to be good, but they are. You know. Yeah, I'd have a hard time picking my favorite between Batman and Ninjago. Yeah. Uh, here's the thing about Ninjago: it's clear that this was like a specific toy line they wanted to market, and so they kind of world check. They shackled the writers with, like, okay, you have to have all of these characters. Because there's, like, five yeah. or six ninjas, I forget. But it would have worked with three. And it feels like the writers would have just written three if they hadn't been told, like, you have to have these characters. Yeah. But outside of that, outside of what they were just forced to work with, Ninjago is the better of the two. Hmm. I did like Batman. I liked Lego Batman. It's very fast-paced, very funny, a lot of good callbacks to other Batman, other Batman stories, other incarnations of Batman. Yeah. It's just overall a very funny movie. Um, not, not nearly as good or as deep as the Lego movie. But I don't think... It was going to be hard for them to top it. Yeah, it was going to be hard for them to top the Lego movie. Uh, Lego Ninjago... That was... I haven't seen it yet, but... I will admit, (laughs) when I heard about it, I was like... This is the one I don't think is going to work, just because... Specific toy line (laughs) that is just kind of there, I guess. Here's the thing. Two years ago, if you'd been like... Hey, Matt, you want to go see a Lego Ninjago (laughs) movie... I'd have been like, pass. I've seen the Bionicle movies. I know how these things go. Um, Yeah. But because of Warner Animation Group, who made the Lego movie, which I think is probably one of the best films of the decade, if not the best film of the decade. um, Lego movie. And then last year they made Storks, which was incredibly funny. And then they made Lego Batman earlier this year which was incredibly funny. And I'm like, okay, after these three films, Warner Animation has got me. I'll go see anything Warner Animation makes. They are the new Pixar. I'm glad to see someone's making good animated movies then. Because, yeah. Man, Pixar... Sorry, guys. You're done. Like, you you made Cars 3. I can't deal with... That anymore. Your movies aren't cons- aren't assumed to be good anymore. Friendship ended with Pixar. <laughs> now Warner Animation Group is my best friend. Um. Uh. 
Yeah, and then Lego Ninjago just there. There are some, there's some deeper stuff in there about like you know parenting and yeah growing up. There's a good story in there. Mm. Um, it does get kind of bogged down in the fact that they have to have all these characters, but I don't think that bogs down the story too much. Um. Because it's not like any of them are poorly written characters or annoying or get in the way of the plot. They're just sort of extraneous. Which, you know... Kind of background, I guess. Yes. They're almost... Because they they serve a point, but the five of them serve a point that three of them could. Yeah. (laughs) But I I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was a good movie. Uh, one of my favorites. I love Warner Animation Group. I will go see anything they put out until they start making crappy movies. <laughs> Moving on. Shape of Water. Good movie. Sure. I'm going to come out and say it. Del Toro's best movie. At least of the Del Toro movies I've seen. Like, I know everyone loves Pan's Labyrinth, but... I think I'm going to pick Shape of Water over Pan's yeah. Labyrinth. Um, it is another movie that is about weird kinky sex. So that's, for those of you counting at home, that's three movies of highly recommended about weird kinky shit. The, the Raw, uh, Professor Marston and the Wonder Woman, Shape of Water, which I guess I... I'm on the fence about whether to give Shape of Water an 8.5 or a 9. You know, strong strong 8, light 9. 8.75. Um, there you go. I was trying to keep it, you know, 0. 0.5. Over on my website where I do written reviews, I give yeah. percentages out of 100. Because that feels just a lot more natural to me. But, uh... Yeah. Shape of Water, Del Toro's best movie... It's just really good. All the performances are good. It's a well-written story. It's very interesting. The, yeah. The pacing is much better than a lot of Del Toro films I've seen. Because um, that's kind of the thing with Pan's Labyrinth. It starts a little slow. But, you know, once once shit kicks off, yeah. it's really good. Um, but that's not... At least until the Pale Man scene... At that point, the movie, like, really kicks off. And you're like, oh, this is really great. But Shape of Water is great to start to finish. Highly recommend it. Uh-huh. It's a better movie based on a universal monster movie than the movie based on a universal monster movie we got. True. Because they, they kind of glaze over... How similar this is to Creature from the Black Lagoon. I don't know if that's a movie that exists or if this was supposed to be like a sequel to Creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> oh well. Oh well. Uh, it's just so good. Go see it. It's probably still in theaters, I assume. At yeah, least, it did. At least when we're recording this. It did come out in... Mid December, I think. Yeah. So late, mid to late December. Yeah, it. W- I think it would be then. Yeah. Yeah, I. I hope it gets some Oscar attention. Cause I mean, Del Toro's a repeat offender. They they love yeah repeat offenders. Um. Repeat offender meaning he's won Oscars before. <laughs> I want to clear that up in the wake of the Weinstein stuff. <sighs> Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two. Nine out of ten. I'll be honest, I that one I may have liked more than the first Guardians. I wasn't to ready honest. to admit it when the fir- when it came out. When I when it came out, I was like, yeah. Oh. But now I'm ready to admit it. It's better than the first Guardians. It definitely is. There's because everyone has a character arc in this movie. Yeah. It's very which I think was kind of absent from the first film. It's very character oriented, which I like. It's also a lot more straightforward. In the yeah. first movie, they were running around a lot, There's... whereas in Guardians Two, they're they're kind of stuck to a few locations. 
there's like three locations that are in it for a significant period of time, I feel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's some like deeper stuff going on in it about like parenthood and stuff. Uh, Lindsay Ellis made a great video about it, analyzing why this movie's so great. It's just, it's the best MCU movie, honestly. They actually had a good villain this time, too, in my opinion. He's, yeah. not, he's not Loki, but he's yeah. definitely uh, seems to uh, be much better than, say, what's-his-name in Ant-Man was. Oh, yeah, there was a villain in Ant-Man. Yeah, now that you mention it, maybe? The spider. <laughs> the... The... The I don't Ant-Man remember. guy? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> I barely... I, that movie was so forgettable. Um, it was... Yeah. Like, there were some good jokes that were clearly left over from Edgar Wright's script. It was better than it... And sh- yeah. Paul Rudd. Always great. He was good. Yeah. Love Paul Rudd. It was better than it should have been with all the directing changes and everything, but... Yeah. The directing changes definitely killed it. Yeah. Um, but Guardians, though. Guardians Volume 2, it's like this deep and emotional movie, but it's also this really fun blockbuster movie uh, where stuff blows up and people get killed. I remember in the first one, I was kind of, when I saw the first one, I was thinking to myself, uh, Yondu, the guy with the arrow, he's, he's, he's pretty powerful, I guess. This one, he confirmed that I, that he was, uh, I realized, yeah, that would be hard to uh, fight against, but, but yeah, yeah, no. yeah. I yeah, I just overall really liked. <laughs> it's it's my favorite MCU movie now, which I mean, Guardians One was my favorite MCU movie, just because I thought the humor was the best in that one. Um, but now it's definitely Guardians Two, although a step above that even. Logan. L- Logan. I don't know why I'm pointing this direction. The poster goes here. <laughs> Logan, another 9 out of Logan. 10. Great movie. Great movie. Um. Yeah. Nice it, send-off for, uh, for Hugh Jackman. For Hugh Jackman. Here's the thing. This movie has something that I think as far as I can remember, only one other superhero movie has. Closure. And the other movie that has that is Dark Knight Rises, which is very mm. disappointing conclusion. <laughs> so it has closure, which is so nice and refreshing to it see. It really isn't one many with closure, is there? You're right. No, because they always want to leave it open for a sequel. Yeah. But then the movie is so bad that it never gets a sequel. <laughs> And then, of course, you got Marvel, which... And then, yeah, Marvel's trying to keep it going forever. Doesn't want to end their sequels. Yeah. So... Um, Logan. And it's so emotional. And, I, I mean, like, I could go through and nitpick it. Like, oh, like, the lady has her fo- the video on her phone that's, like, extremely well edited. And it's like... Why would you have video that well edited on your phone? There's, there's a few moments that I feel like it crosses the line and you, you kind of poke holes in this all day. That's a lot of but, movies, though. Yeah, that's... Here's the thing. Superhero movies are so scared to have a quiet moment. And this movie just has this whole scene where... Wolverine and Professor X and the little girl X-23 they all they, like they show up at these people's houses and they sit down and they have dinner and they're just it's a quiet moment which is so refreshing that's that's what Logan is it's refreshing it's so different from every superhero movie we've seen up to this point how many superhero movies actually are willing to be have closure? Kind of sad at times too, you know. 
Yeah, not it's many. not. It's not action front to back. Not that there's not action, but the action movie in this, the action in this movie is phenomenal. Yeah, because it's an R-rated movie. <laughs> but I mean, the- like that moment where it's like, "Don't take all the juice," and you're just like, "He's gonna take it all," and then he takes <laughs> it all, and you're like, "Yeah!" <laughs> Jumping through the air, kill, killing the fuck out of everyone. Slicing people, slicing and dicing. Only R-rated superhero movie that's not Deadpool, I guess. No, there are plenty. Uh, Wait, uh, never mind. You're right. In recent memory, yeah. Only, but only good one. It was Blade. I liked Blade. I liked Blade Two. Forgot too. about the Blade ones. Yeah. Um. Punisher movies. You're right. All three of them. Yeah. First yeah. one since kind of the MCU became a thing. I think. More or less. Yeah. More or less. Yes. Mm. PG-13 has become the status quo for superhero movies. Because they want that teen audience. Well, they want to let more uh, younger people watch it to yeah. the <laughs> biggest audience possible. There's, a, there's a lot of... In the MCU kind of sterilizes a lot of stuff. So it's like, yeah, this is something you can bring your eight, nine year old to. <laughs> it's a PG thirteen because we want teenagers to think it's violent and edgy, but it's it's clean enough for your eight year olds. Yeah. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Some of them. <laughs> but that that was my biggest problem with Age of Ultron. Yeah, was how much they sterilized it. Well, Logan, I loved. Um, stuff above Logan, the big sick, nine out of ten. And if I'm being honest, the big sick and Logan are probably tied for my second favorite movie of the year. But I'm putting the big oh. sick above Logan because yeah. Logan is like a billion dollar superhero movie, and this is like an indie romantic comedy, so I can. I can keep my pretentious, uh, my pretentious movie critic cred. You get a few more uh, critic points this way, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's just a really good romantic comedy. Um, it's awkward, but like, yeah, not in an embarrassing way, in like an endearing way. Um, based on a true story, hmm. I really liked it. Um, very funny. Very heartwarming. I mean, again, it's awkward in an endearing way. Um, I saw this in an empty theater by myself. (laughs) And there were a lot of moments I was laughing where I'm like, a normal person probably wouldn't be laughing at this. But I thought it was fun. Um, I don't know that I have that much to say about it. There's another Amazon movie. Uh, it is something I do. Yeah. It's just really good. And I really recommend you check it out. The Big Sick. You got anything? Um, nothing I have to add. Alright, then let's move on to my number one movie of the year. Get Out! 9.5 out of 10. Matt, you didn't give any movies a 10 out of 10 this year? No. That's... Like, Arrival was a 10 out of 10, but uh, 10 out of 10s are rare. You there can't just... many perfect movies. Yeah, you can't just give everything a 10 out of 10. Um, man, yeah. Get Out just... It's so good. So I was talking about uh, how... If a movie is allegorical, it has to be a good movie, still. This movie, it's deep, it's got a deep allegory. I think what it has to say socially is very valuable. Uh, This kind of look at, uh, like, liberal racism. This look, like... It has all these, like, the dumb things white people say to try to prove they're not racist. But they all kind of have a point. They all come back later. 
Like, it, it is very Edgar Wright in a way, because he likes to make a call forward, a lot of foreshadowing in Edgar Wright's movies. There's a lot of foreshadowing in this movie. Um, it's, it's very deep. Um, got a lot to say socially. But it's also just a good horror movie. Yeah. Like, it's really scary, it's really well filmed, really well acted. And I, and I do feel that, like, uh, I don't know, maybe it's just me. I, I admit I did not fully see the, the entire uh, twist, the way they did it, coming. No, yeah, but, it, was, yeah. it was a good reveal. Um, Overall, uh, it's, it's one of those movies like uh, Rosemary's Baby or... Um, uh, like Wicker Man, where you're like, you know there's something fishy going on, but you don't know what it is and how far it goes, who all's involved. You just know something up. Yeah. Which kind of keeps you on edge the whole movie. It's a kind of horror movie which I don't think... doesn't seem to be as common as it should be, I guess. Yeah, that's... I feel I'd come to hate it if, like, every movie was that, but I do like... I. But I do think we could always use a we could use a few more ones like that though. Yeah, so. it's just a really yeah. good horror movie. It's really like the cinematography is great, the acting is great. There's just a lot of positives to this movie. Um, if I had to hit it with some negatives, uh, there's it feels like there were a few studio note moments, like not enough jump scares. Please add jump scare here. And so there's this moment where he's, like, going outside to take a smoke, and uh, the housemaid walks by in the background, and there's this loud piano, like, dun! And it's like, first off, we don't even know there's anything up with her. We don't know if she's up to anything. She's just there. <coughs> Second off, he didn't see her. That is purely for the audience's benefit. And third, it's just a really unnecessary place. This is not like something in the movie made a jump scare. The soundtrack made a jump scare. Uh, I uh, was talking about the jump scare, which was bullshit. Um, and then it feels like there was another studio note where they were just like, Reveal of this character, not obvious enough. Please make more obvious. And... Uh... I am going to momentarily yeah. spoil this movie. So if you haven't seen it, please go see it. It's my favorite movie of the year. Here's your warning. It's not even that big of a spoiler warning. There's just this moment late in the film where the girl, like, bursts out of the house. And she's just really awkwardly like, Grandpa. And it's like... Like, no one would say that that way. It was just there to reveal to the audience who another character was. It's like, oh, could have that's her grandfather. More, could have been a little more subtle. Could have been more subtle than that. But those feel like studio notes. Uh, maybe I'm just saying that because I want to give uh, Jordan Peele the benefit of the doubt here. Yeah. Um, I mean, he did a great job. For someone who's known for comedy to come out of the gates with such a good horror movie, I mean, man, it's really unfortunate that this is a genre film and the Academy hates genre films. It's certainly, uh... Horror movies have slid by before, like... Yeah. The Exorcist, Jaws... The Silence of the Lambs, and I think The Sixth Sense, all slid in. So maybe, maybe Jordan Peele can slide in, be like... He at least deserves a nomination. Hey, at guys. Least. So. Best director right here. Because <laughs> this was the yeah. best directed movie of the year. He deserves best director, and this deserves best picture, at least of the movies I've seen. I should clarify at least of the movies I've seen. Uh, well, you've seen. It sounds like you've seen most of the movies that are to be seen so far. I, I've so. seen a lot. Uh, I want to see yeah. the Florida Project when it comes out on yeah. DVD, and uh, the Post has a lot of buzz around it. 
It's a movie about the Pentagon Papers, which I'd be really interested in. Uh, that it's a 2016, 2017 movie that doesn't actually come out until this Friday. So I'm kind of interested to see that. You'd think it would be a 2018 movie, but... It's because it had limited <laughs> release. They showed it, I to, think, they showed it uh, to the director's friend. I think yep. <laughs> your movie has to be shown in Los Angeles before huh. it can be considered for the Oscars. So that's... Okay. Like, whichever year your yeah. movie got shown in L.A., is the year so it far, gets nominated for an Oscar. So if you release a movie everywhere but L.A. in 2017, release it in L.A. in 2018, it's a 2018 movie. Yes, according to the Oscars. Um, I'm just going to continue to not understand that. <laughs> uh, I think those two are the only ones I really want... Well. And I mean, presumably in the coming weeks, people will be yeah. dropping their top ten list. And I'll be like, oh, I gotta see that, and I gotta For see that, and I gotta see that. But, uh, just of the ones I've seen, get yeah. out. By, like, by far the best. Such a great movie. I really loved it. Uh, all the movies we talked about here in part three, I would recommend you go see. Um... I don't know. I don't have much else to say. Anything else? Uh, nothing 2017 else. 2017 in general? Get Out was great. All the horror movies in general this year are great. Yep. That's Not it. all the horror movies. Okay, a lot. More than usual. <laughs> Not Flatliners or Annabelle yeah. Origins. But yeah, good year for horror. Yeah. Alright. Looking forward to 2018. Thanks for being here, Peter. Thanks for uh, letting me be here. And I will see you all in the future. See ya.